Emmanuel. It's an immense pleasure to uh, introduce Dan Bolning to uh, our seminar's audience. Uh, Dan received his uh, PhD from the University of California at Davis. Uh, he worked under the supervision of one of the most talented evolutionary physiologists, perhaps the most talented ph evolutionary physiologist, Peter Wainwright. And he worked uh, on intraspecific competition and niche evolution. After a brief postdoc at UC Davis, he moved to Austin, Texas, where he stayed until uh, 2018. And then he moved to uh, University of Connecticut, where he is now. Dan has very broad interests. Um, he's interested uh, by the interplay of ecology and evolution and uh, more specifically on their interplay on uh, immunology and behavior for parasite interactions with a special emphasis on uh, individual variation. Uh, most of his work is um, um, empirical, but actually uh, uh, Dan does not shy of uh, uh, ranging into theoretical ground and uh, produce uh, some uh, extremely interesting papers. His uh, research is very interesting and uh, he's been very successful in uh, uh, producing uh, um, papers that uh, people read and remark. Uh, he has his name on the ch award charts of all the major uh, societies and in particular, he unified the Young Investigator Prize of the ASN, the SSC, and the Ecological Society of America in 2005. Uh, since 2018, uh, Dan is the uh, editor-in-chief of uh, a journal which is very dear to my heart, The American Naturalist. Uh, and he has um, contributed greatly in maintaining uh, uh, the AMNAT uh, in its uh, very uh, uh, high standards, especially uh, under some very tormented uh, times. Uh, finally, I, I encourage everyone to take a look at his website, but I encourage particularly graduate students to uh, uh, check the lab values tab. You will find some uh, very useful advice uh, for uh, shaping your career. And uh, now it's time I pass the uh, microphone to Dan. Many thanks again, Dan, for accepting to give this seminar. I'm sure everybody will find it extremely interesting. Thank you. Can you now see the uh, my screen? Yes. Excellent. Well, so thank you for the invitation. It's a, a shame that I can't visit in person, of course. Uh, I had a wonderful time in Montpellier uh, two years ago for the evolution meeting. And um, one of these days I will come back in person again when such things are permissible and safe. Um, I want to talk to you today about some work that has really occupied much of the last decade of my lab. And it, uh, it's ongoing work. And so there are elements of what I'll tell you about that are complete stories and there are elements that are a work in progress. And let me, there we go. Um, and the reference in my title, many of you may know this, but um, Pyrrhic victory is a phrase that's used often to refer to winning a battle, but losing the actual war. Um, and it refers to a historical figure, King Pyrrhus of the Paris, um, who, was the first, I believe, to use war elephants in attacking Rome. And he won every single battle that he fought in the Italian, in the Italian peninsula. But he had no system for uh, reinforcing his army and replacing lost troops. And so although he won every single battle that he fought, his army became atten so attenuated through time that he had to retreat with basically nothing to show for all of the effort. And supposedly he uh, said, if we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. So I want to use this metaphor of a Pyrrhic victory as a framework for thinking today about 
the notion of costs and benefits of immunity, and in particular, how hosts can evolve to resist parasites, um, but there may be situations where they opt not to and instead shift towards a tolerant strategy that seeks to avoid fighting the battle or give up the battle because the costs of winning may be too great. And so I'm gonna to try to convince you that we've found an empirical system that fits this Pyrrhic victory framework uh, where some populations seem to have uh, taken King Pyrrhus's approach and fought and fought and fought to great cost to themselves and others seem to have said, eh, forget about it. And the basis for today's story um, is something that I actually had seen hints about for many, many years. And so I also, in addition to this particular quote, want to start you off with another quote, this time from Bern Heinrich, who's a behavioral ecologist at the University of Vermont, or was, he's retired now. And he wrote a wonderful book, Ravens in Winter, that I recommend to anybody interested in thinking about the thought process of science. And in this book, he becomes curious about why ravens would share food with other ravens in the winter when food is scarce and a carcass of a deer isn't going to rot. So they have this food resource that they find and why not just keep it secret? But instead they go and call in others to share it with them. And he spends a decade running little experiments in his free time to understand this. And he starts out the book with this wonderful quote. It's amazing how you can see something every day and yet not notice it. He had seen ravens on carcasses in the woods in Maine for years, but never paid close attention. And so equally, today's story is a story about my version of this, seeing something regularly for many years, but not paying any attention to it and realizing eventually that perhaps I ought to have been paying attention to it all along. And so there's a little bit of a morality tale here of as you do science, paying a little closer attention to those things that puzzle you but weren't your main focus. And the thing that I saw every day but didn't pay deep attention to for quite a long time was the interaction between three-spine stickleback, which I began studying early in graduate school, and this tapeworm Schistocephalus solidus shown here that regularly infects stickleback in some populations but not others. Now, I had started recording when I saw this tapeworm when I first began dissecting stickleback in graduate school. The first time I found one, I thought, I don't know what this is, I'd better make a note of it. And I found them occasionally, and I would always note down when I found one, but I never really asked extensive questions about this tapeworm because I was focused on testing other things. Um, along the lines of things that you might've seen but not noticed, there's a second tapeworm in this image, this little tiny one here and in the circle. And uh, part of the story today is delving into why some of the tapeworms in the system are so tiny and others are so big and what that can tell me about evolution of the host immune system and how species interactions drive evolution. And yet there are other situations where we have really, really intense infections such as shown here. Um, all of those tapeworms came out of that one individual stickleback. And so to some extent, it's impossible to not observe this and think that's very, very impressive. That's very disturbing. Um, but it's another thing to begin thinking, what's happening here? What are my hypotheses? What are the predictions and expectations and explanations for variation that I observe? And so I've, my very first observation of this host parasite interaction happened in grad school. Um, I'd collected some fish in December of 1999 in some lakes in British Columbia. I was dissecting them in the winter and spring and started noticing them, but again, documented, but didn't look deeply. And it took a few years, about five years later, uh, we were doing a big survey of many lakes on Vancouver Island to estimate selection gradients and how does disruptive selection vary from one lake to the next. And my lab technician, Anli Lau, who is doing 
thousands of dissections and morphological measurements, um, systematically noted down all of the schistocephalus tapeworms that she came across and built up a very nice data set for a couple of easily observed parasites. And I hadn't told her to do this. This was entirely on her own initiative. And she generated this data, but it still wasn't enough to grab my attention. And so it took another uh, member of the lab, a graduate student, Will Stutz, um, to say, I'd really like to analyze these data a little bit. And so Will delved into the data that An Lee had generated. And what he found was that the abundance of this parasite, the fraction of fish who were infected, varied dramatically from one lake to the next. So in some lakes, uh, infection rates were on the order of 70 or 80% of the individuals. In other lakes, we observed no schistocephalus whatsoever. And some of these are based on very large sample sizes. So Cecil Lake, for example, we had nearly 1,000 fish. Roberts Lake, we had nearly 1,500 fish measured and saw zero schistocephalus. So we're very confident that the tapeworm is not present in the fish. And so at this point, I had been working on stickleback for eight years, but hadn't really asked myself, why is this parasite found in some populations, but not others? And the immediate question that came to mind when Will showed me this graph is how much of this variation is ecological and how much of it is immunological? Is this an evolutionary or an ecological problem? And for those of you who know me, you'll know uh, that my answer is probably going to be some combination of the two. It's not really either or, but I do like to provoke my immunology colleagues by saying, maybe the field of immunology is irrelevant here. And this is just about ecology because if you don't encounter the parasite, your immunity to it is absolutely irrelevant. So should we be ecologists or should we be immunologists? From there and giving away some of the answer to the first question, I'll move on to the question of is resistance an effective and desirable strategy? And then we'll delve into some of the genetics of this resistance and some of the genetics of uh, pathological side effects that come with the resistance. So to begin with, I want to introduce some of the main characters in today's story. Uh, Three-spine stickleback shown in this video here. There's a female courting a male. Here she comes again, comes up to the male, uh, not interested. She swims away. Um, as you can see in the background, there are other sticklebacks swimming around. Uh, they exist at very high densities in lakes in British Columbia, which is super convenient because we can sample large numbers of individuals without feeling too guilty about oversampling. Um, they're extraordinarily variable from one lake to another. So this is uh, Blackwater Lake in British Columbia, and the fish in this lake are phenotypically very different from the fish in the stream right next door, which are different from the next lake over. And so it's a very convenient system that's very well exploited by many evolutionary biologists. And one of the primary appeals of this system is that stickleback are historically marine fish living in the ocean. And when places like Vancouver Island were deglaciated about 12 to 14,000 years ago, the Pleistocene glaciers that covered this area melted away and the ocean dwelling stickleback invaded freshwater watersheds and every river basin is an independent replicate of this colonization of a freshwater habitat. And so we have this highly replicated 12,000 year old experiment of marine to freshwater adaptation, as well as adaptation to different freshwater environments. So here's an example of two different watersheds um, and stickleback from the ocean can invade McCrete Lake and they can invade Pie Lake. Ecologically, these lakes are very similar, but they're quite different from some of the very small lakes right nearby. And so we can also look at lake to lake differences. And this has led to divergence both between freshwater populations, which are all of these males shown on top here, versus marine fish, this male on the bottom, but also differences between lakes that can be very dramatic, as shown here with male coloration. 
The most dramatic example of this, of course, are the very well-known benthic and limnetic species pairs that exist in just a few lakes in British Columbia. The benthic species shown here is very large. The limnetic species, and these are both reproductively mature females of the two species. They are reproductively isolated. They are genetically and phenotypically distinct. And they eat different prey. The benthic species eats large insect larvae and the limnetic species tends to eat small plankton. This is a very unique situation. These coexisting sympatric species pairs are found in only a few lakes. They're morphologically very distinct. So this is a micro CT scan of a stickleback skull. And I'm gonna pause it in a second. We're zooming into the inside of the mouth here and pause. You see these comb-like structures here. These are gill raker, gills and gill rakers. And these gill rakers here are used in, in uh, separating food items from the water that the fish uh, sucks into their mouth. And the length and density of these gill rakers um, is a good predictor of the kind of food the that a fish is eating. And it's partly heritable. And so the benthic species has short, few gill rakers and the limnetic species tend to have many densely spaced long gill rakers. And this is a bimodal distribution in uh, Priest Lake, for example, shown here with very few intermediates. Contrast this now with instead what happens in many of the other thousands of lakes on Vancouver Island. I've sampled hundreds of these lakes at this point and the vast majority of lakes in Canada have a single population of stickleback that has a normal distribution of gill raker length, not bimodal. And yet individuals at one end of the distribution predominantly, sorry, predominantly eat zooplankton and individuals at the other end of the distribution predominantly eat benthic prey. And we know this from stomach content analysis correlated with morphology. We know this from stable isotope analyses so for example, this is the proportion of benthic carbon that individuals have been eating based on carbon 12, 13 isotope ratios, trophic position based on nitrogen isotope ratios. Every dot here is an individual fish all caught from a 100 meter long section of shoreline in one lake in one day. And to give you an idea of what this means, so individuals range from about 15% benthic carbon to 100% benthic carbon. To scale that, here's Priest Lake limnetic average and Priest Lake benthic fish, Paxton Lake limnetic and Paxton Lake benthic, and Ormond and Dugout to Parapatric lakes. So the stickleback in this one lake that are shown by dots are more different than the species are found in those species pairs in terms of diet. So a great deal of between individual variation in diet. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this um, is that, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so the, the average of, this, uh, of these uh, solitary lakes tends to be a generalist phenotype, but um, depending on the size of the lake, it shifts from being either on average more benthic to on average being more limnetic. So in very small lakes, the small lakes are dominated by shallow benthic environments. And so the fish eat predominantly benthic invertebrates. And in really big lakes, um, we see mostly limnetic uh, phenotypes. Again, there's a distribution. These big lakes still have benthic feeding individuals. They just happen to be a minority instead of a majority. So the relative abundance of one tail versus the other shifts. And the average shifts as you go from small lakes to big lakes. And the species pair lakes are um, approximately here in terms of lake size. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is that these uh, copepods that are one of the more common limnetic prey happen to be the intermediate host, the first host for the tapeworm that I showed you earlier. So this tapeworm has a complex life cycle. In fact, it's the original complex life cycle that was first discovered. The tapeworm breeds in piscivorous bird intestines. 
Eggs are defecated into the water, they hatch, they're consumed by copepods, which are eaten by stickleback. The parasite will infect multiple species of copepods, some better than others, but stickleback is the only fish that supports um, this tapeworm. No other fish species will support it. And then when stickleback are eaten by birds, the tapeworms get out of the fish and breed. So there's an ecological element to this parasite. It's obtained by eating certain prey. So how much of this variation in abundance that I already showed you is because of what the fish eat and how much of it is immunological? So is this a difference in exposure risk? These may be our benthic populations and they just don't eat copepods. And these may be our, our limnetic populations. Or is it differences in resistance where these populations are susceptible and these populations are resistant? So there is ecological variation in the abundance of this parasite. The parasite's far more common in lakes than in streams and in freshwater environments than in the ocean largely because the parasite's eggs do not survive very well in brackish salty water. It turns out, and I won't show you the details here, that the fish in um, the marine environments in anadromous fish are naive to the parasite and highly susceptible. When we do laboratory experiments on lab-raised fish, we can infect about 90% of the fish reliably. Um, and so this low infection rate of the marine fish is not because they're resistant. The low infection rate is because they just don't get exposed. They're actually very susceptible. But then why is there so much variation within and among lakes? So for example, we're gonna focus on Gosling Lake and Roberts Lake. And to help you remember, R, the first letter of the name Roberts, um, also stands for resistant. So Roberts Lake, we have never seen the tapeworm in a live wild fish. Gosling Lake, we see them very regularly. Um, and so we have a conceptual model here um, to try and understand some of the variation in parasite prevalence. Um, some of this may be individual level effects. So individuals who eat more limnetic prey should get more of this parasite. And that turns out to be true. In a replicated study um, of 18 lakes, consistently individuals inside each lake that have more limnetic morphology are more likely to carry this parasite. So within a given lake, individuals at this tail of the distribution of phenotypes are more infected than individuals at this tail. The reverse is true for a benthic transmitted parasite. Across lakes, we find that um, populations with uh, longer gill rakers and populations with more benthic prey tend to have a higher uh, intensity or prevalence of schistocephalus. So both individuals that are more limnetic get more infected and populations that are more limnetic get more infected. Um, so there's clearly ecological control of exposure rates that leads to variation in infection. But here we have, again, Gosling Lake has a very high infection rate. Roberts Lake has a very low infection rate, but they have basically the same ecomorphology. They have the same abundance of copepods in their stomach contents. They have very similar stable isotopes. Ecologically, these are very similar populations. They both have loons nesting in them. They both have mergensers. So everything ecologically is in place and basically indistinguishable between these two lakes, but we have a lot of residual variation in the infection rate that we observe. So what's the difference between these lakes? It's not just noise, it's not just a fluke. We have a long-term data set at this point, and although the parasite rate varies from year to year, Gosling Lake is always heavily infected, Roberts Lake is always uninfected. And to back up, I'm going to use these icons to remind you which is which. We have a healthy, happy fish, no infection, and we have a very sad fish with lots of parasites. And I'll use those images to remind you of who's who throughout the talk. Okay, so to ask whether there's an immunological element to this, we did what comes naturally for quantitative geneticists, which is we raised fish in the laboratory. 
and we experimentally infected them. So we had pure Gosling, pure uh, Roberts and F1 hybrids, reciprocals. We experimentally infected them either with tapeworm infected copepods or we had controls where we fed them copepods with no tapeworms. And we asked, what are their immune phenotypes? What are their infection rates? And the, infect the immune phenotypes are very different. The Roberts Lake fish show a large increase in the abundance of granulocytes compared to uninfected control individuals. Whereas the Gosling Lake fish don't show a response. F1s have an interesting maternal effect. The Roberts Lake fish have constitutively higher reactive oxygen production per granulocyte. So they have both more granulocytes and constitutively higher ROS, which is a compound that can degrade pathogens and parasites uh, tissue. And they have a slightly lower infection rate. There's a weakly significant tendency for the Roberts Lake genotypes to be less infected in experimental exposures than the Gosling, but it's not a strong trend. It appears to maybe be a recessive trait. But what really struck us is the difference in cestode size. These are two petri dishes with tapeworms and these tapeworms are full siblings. We bred their parents together to make eggs. We experimentally fed them to stickleback. They're both 43 days old. These came out of the Roberts Lake fish. These came out of the Gosling Lake fish. Um, that turns out to be a heritable fish level trait. So this is looking at our Roberts Lake genotype, Gosling Lake genotype, F1s, F2s, and reciprocal back crosses. And we see perfectly clear log scale control of host genotype regulating parasite somatic growth. We either have very, very big parasites or we have vanishingly small parasites, depending on the genotype of the fish. So is this ecology or immunology? The answer is yes, both of course. Limnetic diet enhances exposure risk, but there are also heritable differences in immunity that allow some populations to reduce cestode establishment and reduce cestode growth if they succeed in establishing. So now I wanna zoom in on this question of why some populations succeed and others fail. Is more investment in defense inherently better? So to get at this, um, we have a recently uh, departed uh, world leader here who at one point said that he wanted a defense, a, a military that was bigger, better and stronger. Um, and it's worth asking oneself, is that actually desirable? Or is excessive defense a liability that slows you down and actually makes imposes costs that are not worth the benefits? So we can think about this from a quantitative genetic optimization standpoint. Let's imagine a quantitative immune trait could be constitutive or induced. And the more you invest in this immune trait, the lower the parasite load, which gives you a fitness benefit, and that's good. But often there are thresholds where you might invest so much that you just kill all of the parasites. And any additional investment in the paras in an immunity has no additional benefit to it. So you continue to accrue costs because immune investment is not without energetic cost, cost of autoimmune damage to your own tissues. Um, so once you pass that threshold of being completely immune, any further investment is just incurring costs with no benefits. So if we think about the net benefit, we might decide that there's some optimum, which is your best possible immune investment that balances your costs and benefits to the best of your ability. So you might expect the phenotype distribution to fall at that optimum. Uh, you might expect it to actually fall on the shallow shoulder and the ecological context, how often you see these parasites, your energetic income, uh, predation rates, other things can shift the cost benefit balances here, change the slope and shape of the best benefit and cost curves to change the location of the optimum. So maybe we have some lakes where the optimum is further to the left and some lakes where the optimum is further to the right. We also might expect some populations to incur an excessive cost 
And that's because being over-defended may be harmful but not lethal, but being under-defended can be lethal. And so you can have asymmetric fitness landscapes that actually lead to the evolution of an, ecolog an evolutionary equilibrium where the mean phenotype actually settles farther to one side of the optimum. So it's not optimizing individual fitness, but it is keeping you away from the cliff edge of really awful outcomes. So asymmetric selection can favor investment in an excessive and costly defensive system. So is that happening here? The trick is we actually have very limited evidence for immune costs in wild populations. And so I'm gonna tell you about those costs today. And this comes back to that thing that I overlooked for many years. So my former postdoc, Natalie Steinel, who's a trained, a PhD immunologist, worked on mouse T cells, came to my lab and started doing experimental immune challenges, injecting antigens into fish that we could trace and figure out how macrophages and dendritic cells were grabbing artificial antigens and moving them into the B cell germinal centers of the fish. And she was injecting fish with antigens and with uh, vaccine adjuvant as a control and with saline as a control. And she came to me one day and said, Dan, I noticed something really strange in our controls that we were giving alum, this vaccine adjuvant. Come, come look at this. And she showed me something and I immediately said, I know exactly what you're talking about. So sorry for the gruesome image right before your dinner. This is a liver of a dissected fish. So you're looking at the internal organs of a stickleback and we're moving them around. And what I want you to appreciate is that these organs move very freely. They're not really attached to each other. They're not attached to the body wall of the fish. This is the way a fish should be. What Natalie saw looked like this. The internal organs were all glued together in this fibrous mass of sticky material. They were glued to the body wall. The liver was stuck to the intestines. And um, Natalie said, I have no idea what I'm looking at here. And I said, I don't know either, but I have seen this before. When I was dissecting stickleback in graduate school, when I was dissecting stickleback as an early faculty member, I've seen this many times in wild caught fish. It's not just a result of her vaccination strategy. This is something that really happens in nature. But I had always ignored it because I thought, huh, that's strange. Maybe I didn't preserve my fish well enough. Maybe I didn't freeze them fast enough. Maybe I put them in formaldehyde and the formaldehyde didn't get into their bodies quickly enough. And it's just a side effect of bad preservation. So I had spent literally 13 years ignoring this phenotype that I was seeing in wild caught animals because I didn't think it mattered. I didn't think it was a real thing. Um, it's amazing how you can see something every day and not notice it. So it turns out that it's a real thing. So this is what's known as fibrosis. This is widely known in humans, actually about 40% of deaths in uh, rich world countries have fibrosis as a major contributing factor to death, including heart disease and cancer. Um, and what it is is a buildup of connective tissue, fibrinogen, fibronectin, and collagen forming scar tissue. So this is a saline injected stickleback in the gut. This is the intestinal wall. This is inside the intestine. This is the spleen over here. But when we inject fish with either alum, which is a vaccine adjuvant, or with tapeworm protein extracts, we see this buildup of this purpley blue material here, which is a dense mat of collagen that glues the spleen onto the intestine. So we histologically confirm that what we're seeing is fibrosis, this buildup of scar tissue. And it turns out that we see genetic control of fibrosis. So in F2 hybrid stickleback, when they're infected by a tapeworm, they're much more likely to have fibrosis than when there's no viable living tapeworm left. Um, and fibrosis is far more common in this resistant Roberts Lake genotype. It is absent in the Gosling Lake genotype, um, or, or almost absent. And I should note briefly here that although we see fibrosis in uninfected fish, there's a reason for this. These fish were exposed to the tapeworm experimentally but the tapeworm died. 
Um, and we now know that when we induce fibrosis, it can last for months, at least three months after the experimental challenge. So they can start fibrosis, kill the worm, get rid of the worm. We don't see the infection, but we still see the fibrosis lasting afterwards. So fibrosis is more common in Roberts Lake genotypes after they see a tapeworm. And that fibrosis contributes strongly to suppression of tapeworm size. So in Gosling back cross, F2 intercross, and Roberts Lake back cross, individuals with fibrosis have smaller worms than individuals without fibrosis, controlling for that genetic background. So that's very exciting. We have reason to believe now that fibrosis is controlling tapeworm size. We also believe that it controls tapeworm viability. So uh, this is a tapeworm over here. It's very, very small. In a Gosling Lake, this tapeworm would fill the entire body cavity, be the same size as the intestine and organs. Here, this tapeworm is wrapped inside a ball of fibrous material, a granuloma, and this tapeworm is half dead. Um, it's partly degraded and digested, and we found many of these granulomas that contain no detectable tapeworm, but still have residual tapeworm RNA and DNA. So we know that they were there, but they're now dead. Fish with fibrosis are more likely to have these granulomas. So using F2 hybrids and back crosses, um, we can genetically partition the effects of phenotypes here. And Roberts Lake ancestry contributes to having fibrosis in exposed fish. And that fibrosis has a negative effect on cestode mass. Roberts Lake ancestry also contributes to higher reactive oxygen, which directly reduces cestode mass and indirectly reduces cestode mass by promoting fibrosis because fibrosis is exaggerated by inflammation. And then Roberts Lake fish are smaller, which uh, would reduce cestode mass. And there's still unaccounted for effects of Roberts Lake ancestry on reducing cestode mass. So we have actually multiple pathways that we can detect through path analysis by which Roberts Lake genotype impacts cestode mass. Um, this is not simply in the laboratory. We've gone out into wild populations and measured fibrosis scores on a quantitative scale, an ordinal scale, and measured tapeworm mass. And we find that um, fish with more fibrosis have uh, smaller tapeworms inside lakes. We find the same trend across lakes. Lakes with more abundant fibrosis on average have smaller tapeworms on average. So why isn't everybody doing this? It, kills tapeworms, it reduces the size of the tapeworms who survive, and yet we have multiple lakes on Vancouver Island with and without fibrosis. We have multiple lakes in Alaska with and without fibrosis, and we know of two lakes in uh, Scotland, one with and one without fibrosis. Why isn't this universal? The answer appears to be um, that it's costly. So when tapeworm, when fibrosis is absent, we actually don't see in the laboratory a big reproductive cost to females of having the cestode. This is after only three day, 43 days. So it might be that if we let the cestode grow to full size um, two months later, we would see a reproductive impact of the infection. But a month and a half into the infection, they really don't care. But they do care about fibrosis. Fibrosis limits female reproduction in the lab. And then we go in the wild and wild caught females. Also, we see a significant negative effect of fibrosis on females reproductive state. We don't see a significant effect of fibro of infection on female reproductive state using either gravid, not gravid as a score. If we use gonad mass, we do see some effect of infection, but it's weaker than the effect of, an, of fibrosis. So the immune response suppresses reproduction more than the infection does on its own. And we've uh, looked at male reproduction as well. In the wild, males with fibrosis are less likely to be successfully nesting than males without fibrosis. So this gets back to the Pyrrhic victory part of the story. Um, the stickleback are incurring a massive cost in reproductive success. We also now know through experimental work with George Lauder at Harvard doing biomechanics, 
that fibrotic fish are not able to do predator evasion as well. We know through work with Jesse Weber's lab that fish with fibrosis incur a higher metabolic cost. So this is terrible. So these fish are successfully inducing fibrosis when they see a worm, but that, and that successfully kills the cestode or reduces cestode growth, but it demolishes their reproductive success. Clearly other populations said, this is not worthwhile. We're not gonna do fibrosis. Instead, we're gonna go ahead and reproduce despite having these very large tapeworms. And in the lakes that have high abundances of tapeworms, we see females that are perfectly gravid. We see males who are defending nests who have tapeworms. So they're able to get away with this. So the question then is why do some populations show tolerance and some populations adopt this pyrrhic resistance? Presumably the answer has something to do with different optima depending on different environments, but I can't really answer at the moment the ecological conditions that toggle between one situation and the other. To figure that out, we need to investigate this in many lakes. And to do that, it really helps to know the genetics. And so we've started working on the genetics of this system, both to better understand its evolutionary ecology, but also because here we have a situation where we have naturally evolved um, variation in fibrosis susceptibility, which is very interesting from a biomedical standpoint. Fibrosis is a major contributor to human disease and mortality. And if we could understand why some genotypes have more fibrosis than others, it turns out that some populations can heal and remove their fibrosis more quickly than others. Um, how do they do that? And so we're starting and have been working for a number of years now on the genetics of this fibrosis. Um, and to do this, we can build on everything that immunologists have learned about this type one to type two immunity axis that can range from um, um, successful immunity that, that's homeostatic to harmful inflammation that can have a fibrotic uh, allergic effect. So I'm, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'm gonna skip a few things, but I wanna just hammer home a few points. First of all, the ability to do fibrosis is uh, in the wild only observed in some lakes. And if we inject fish with saline solution in the lab, they don't have fibrosis. So this is not a resting state phenotype. But if we inject them with alum, a vaccine adjuvant, they all do it. And so um, the cellular capacity to do fibrosis inside the whole body cavity is not a derived state. The ability to do that is widespread. It's the implementation of doing this when they see cestode protein that is a recently evolved phenotype that's specific to a couple of populations. Um, I'm gonna skip over a few elements here, sorry about that. Um, so to figure out the genetic basis of this, we're merging QTL mapping of hybrid stickleback in the lab that we experimentally infect with genome-wide association mapping, with genomic scans to find targets of selection and transcriptomics to try and triangulate the sets of genes that contribute to uh, this variation in resistance. We find QTL, for example, for cestode mass, but also for infection rate and QTL for fibrosis. Um, so for example, here's uh, a locus on linkage group eight, Roberts Lake genotypes at this locus have more fibrosis than Gosling Lake genotypes, uh, intermediate F1 or heterozygotes are intermediate. Uh, reactive oxygen, we see additive genetic control on linkage group 15. Cestode mass, we see uh, what appears to probably be an epistatic effect on linkage group 15 at the same QTL for ROS. Um, so we do have QTL, but those give us a big chunk of a chromosome, which isn't very helpful. So we wanna zoom in a little bit more. And to do that, we did pool seek whole genome sequencing of a hundred fish from the ocean, a hundred Roberts Lake fish and a hundred Gosling fish. And with this, we can find the baseline uh, evolutionary branch lengths between populations and then look for loci with very long branches specifically in Roberts or specifically in Gosling and ask, 
what loci are targets of selection and which population exhibits the selection. And it turns out that it's almost always Gosling Lake that shows the very strong signature of genomic selection in the QTL, which is weird, right? Because Roberts Lake has what seems to be the derived phenotype, but Gosling Lake is the one that has the rapid at recent evolution. So here's an example, very high allele frequency difference and very high population branch statistic in this uh, piece of uh, linkage group two inside our QTL for fibrosis. It's Gosling Lake that shows very rapid evolution in of this fibrosis locus. And this area contains the gene PU1 which was published in a nature paper a year, a year or two years ago now, um, describing this as the control gene for po fibroblast polarization to induce tissue fibrosis. So this is a really promising candidate gene. Um, we also have cestode mass QTL on linkage group 12 that contains STAT6, which is a really well-known candidate gene in immunology for control of parasite infection outcomes for macroparasites. And in PU1, or sorry, in STAT6, we have a frame shifting deletion in the second exon that's destroying the function of that gene. That deletion is unique to Gosling Lake and it's almost completely fixed in Gosling Lake. Roberts Lake and the marine fish don't have it. So again, the evolutionary change is happening in Gosling Lake rather than in Roberts Lake that's the resistant one. Um, a third gene in, in our QTL for cestode size also is a deletion, a 3000 base pair deletion in CYP3A48, which is a gene involved in oxidizing xenobiotics. Again, Gosling Lake has the knockout phenotype and Roberts Lake doesn't. So why is all of the evolution happening in Gosling, but Roberts Lake is the population that's resistant and suppressing tapeworm growth. So marine fish colonize multiple lakes, they, both, they all have high cestode exposure in the lake environment. Both populations reduce infection rates, but fibrosis and cestode growth suppression is unique to Roberts. What's going on? So here's my uh, verbal model. Um, well, I'll, so what we think is happening, and this is also supported by a gene expression analysis, Gosling Lake is down-regulating fibrosis genes and it is up-regulating fibrosis suppression genes, it turns out. Um, and in particular, hepatic nuclear factor for alpha is differentially expressed in Gosling fish after infection. So it's an infection by genotype interaction. This is the upstream regulator of a fibrosis pathway and it is fibrosis suppressive. So the Gosling Lake fish are actually switching on something to turn down fibrosis. So Roberts Lake fish get infected. They don't really change this gene very much. Gosling Lake fish get infected. They change this gene a great deal. So here's my summary of what's happening. 12,000 years ago, marine fish colonized freshwater lakes and they're exposed to this tapeworm for the first time, and that's not good, so they evolve resistance. And both Roberts and Gosling Lake evolve a locus that here is R, um, that confers both reduced infection rate, but also this locus F that confers fibrosis. Um, my conceptual model right now is Gosling Lake probably had fibrosis once upon a time. Um, so we have two derived genes in both of these populations. But Gosling Lake decided that resistance is futile for some ecological reason we don't understand. It wasn't worthwhile. And so uh, these Gosling fish evolved a second set of loci, a, sec a third locus that's a tolerant locus that suppresses that fibrosis. Um, and so now these Gosling fish get heavily infected and the tapeworms grow very well. The marine fish don't get infected because they don't see the parasite, but when we give them the parasite, the parasite does great. The Roberts Lake fish have what appears today to be the derived phenotype. They have fibrosis, they suppress tapeworm growth, but they do it 
not because they've evolved a difference from Gosling, but because Gosling evolved a tolerance strategy that differs from this ancestral state. And that's supported by the fact that Gosling has strong selection on the STAT6 knockout, strong selection on this CYP3A48 knockout, decreased expression of PU1, this fibrosis promoting gene, and gosling fish upregulate this fibrosis suppressive pathway. So we have three genetic elements here that collectively all are gosling fish turning off fibrosis. Why would they do that if they didn't have it to begin with? So I believe they must have had it to begin with. And so I think if we do QTL mapping in the future to compare Roberts versus Marine and gosling versus Marine, we're gonna find pro-fibrosis QTL that are shared by both of these freshwater lakes. So our next steps, we've done gene editing. We're growing up the fish right now. We have knockouts of all of our candidate genes. We need to grow these fish up and do our experimental infections. We need to do our QTL mapping of the both freshwater populations versus the marine fish. And lastly, we're building in a single cell RNA-seq to start to do cell level biology of this system. Um, and then lastly, we want to expand to more species of fish. We have a, a manuscript on BioArchive doing comparative phylogenetic immunology of fibrosis, showing that the ability to do fibrosis is very widespread across fish, but stickleback uniquely apply fibrosis to this particular tapeworm. And with that, I will take questions. Thank you very much, Dan, for this great talk. Uh, we have uh, already two questions in the questions and answers uh, panel. Let's uh, start with uh, Ricardo Poloni. If we can turn his um, microphone on. Yes, can you hear me? Sure. Yes, I was just wondering, but probably um, you half answered <laughs> if there's any any role of the main choice preference in different populations that could drive um, some difference in the in the strategy of in the immunology strategy, like a positive feedback that finally enhances the the immune response in, in, in the population that decided to have this this uh, active uh, defense to towards the, the parasite and that could partly explain the, the, this choice and the opposite choice of the other population that decided to, to quit the, the defense? That's a great question. Um, I don't have much of an answer for you, except to say that um, for reasons that are unclear, and I don't entirely trust this result because it's very qualitative, uh, a student of mine was scoring wild caught fish as just very red or less red. And the fish with fibrosis in the wild, the males, tended to be redder than the fish without fibrosis. Um, so it could be that if females like red color, that they're actually favoring the fibrosis. Um, the flip side is that um, the, the tapeworm is big. And so it makes the fish big. Um, and there's a lot of evidence in stickleback that males prefer large females and females prefer large males. And I actually wonder whether there's a sexual selection benefit for being infected because they get really bloated and big. And does a um, female come along and see an infected male and say, oh, he's really big, I like that. Or does she say, oh, he's really infected, I don't like that. And I don't, I don't know of any study that's tried to separate out uh, sexual selection for larger body size from what happens when a fish gets infected and looks big. Um, so it could actually be that there are benefits to the resistance in sexual selection, but maybe there's actually benefits, sexual selection benefits to being infected. Um, and I, I don't have any data to speak to that one way or another. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I... Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, let's take a question by uh, Thomas Lenormand now. Uh, 
Okay, hi Dan. Um, so those systems are very complex, or well, have a complex life cycle, obviously. And you mentioned that, you know, they go through birds. And all along the talk, you are talking about ecological differences between perhaps those two lakes. And you never really showed anything about how many birds there were and uh, whether, well, their density could be the ecological factor you're, you're looking for. You know, exposure to the parasites, quite obviously, would be important. This, this is something that really bothers me that we don't have data on that. And it's frankly a, a side effect of living in Texas and then Connecticut and my field systems in British Columbia. There are times of year where I just don't get to visit much. Um, but in, this, in the breeding season, at least from April through July when I'm frequently there, um, there's typically only one pair of loons per lake because they're quite territorial. And so these lakes are fairly similar size. They both have one pair of loons every single year. Um, and so I don't think that's a big contributor, uh, but I can't rule out maybe one lake gets visited by more large migratory groups of loons in February and the other doesn't. And maybe, so you get a big group of loons coming in and they defecate lots of eggs. So we do are, are have some camera Are you sure there are only, only loons are involved? Sorry to... Uh, Mergensers are relevant as well. Uh, again, we don't see many and I've seen them on both lakes about equally often. Um, and those are the only bird, those are the only piscivorous birds that I see there with any regularity. There's occasionally a kingfisher, but not much. Um, don't see any herons. So those are really the, the players here. Um, we have camera trap data year round now that we're going through and scoring. Um, and I've tried using eBird, not to much avail. Nobody's registering very, very much data there. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Next question by Thierry Boulinier. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. You're great. Uh, I had uh, at some point you mentioned a maternal effect on the parasite. Uh, I don't know if I, I heard it well. I was just wondering whether uh, if there was a maternal effect, whether it would, could be linked with a fibrosis uh, type of resistance or could it be mediated through antibodies? Yeah. Or some... So the, the maternal effect is specifically rapid onset proliferation of granulocytes, um, which means it's not likely to be an adaptive immune response system. It may be um, what's known, it, it's probably a result of alternatively activated macrophages, which use a type two adaptive immune response like system. So it's actually MA, could be MHC mediated, uh, but it's not correlated with fibrosis genetically or phenotypically. Um, and so we don't see any maternal effect we, for fibrosis. We don't see any sex effect for fibrosis. Um, so I think the answer is in, in this case, it's independent and it's not clear that it does anything very important. We have, we have no correlation between the maternal effect trait and any outcome of infection. But there's no uh, like uh, adaptive immune response in terms of humoral type of response, like antibodies. Um, so stickleback do have all of the toolkits for an adaptive immune response. Um, but in cold water fishes, the adaptive immune response tends to take on the order of a month to really get rolling and, and pick up steam. And we've confirmed that using some of our artificial vaccination strategies, we inject antigens and we track how long it takes the B cell germinal centers to get larger and start showing activity. And the B cell germinal center somatic hypermutation peaks around 35 days after injection. 
everything that we're seeing in terms of growth suppression and fibrosis, that's happening in within the first 24 hours. If we inject tapeworm protein into the resistant populations, we see fibrosis within 24 hours, which is too fast even for a warm-blooded mammalian adaptive immune system. Um, so this is really specifically uh, an innate or an innate-like adaptive response. So these uh, alternatively activated macrophages are straddling the boundary between adaptive and innate uh, immune responses. They're very, they're sort of a very rapid version of the adaptive immune response, but they don't rely on B and T cell proliferation, somatic hypermutation. They use um, pre-existing genetically fixed antibodies that are called natural antibodies that are pre-adapted. They're not tuned based on encounter and experience. So it's not learned, basically, it's encoded. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thierry. Now we have a question uh, by Olivier Ray. Uh, thanks very much. Hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, really nice story. Thanks very much for, for this talk. And my, my, my question was about um, benthic versus limnetic um, um, fish, because you, you found like a, a really great system with two different environment, uh, environments, with two different kind of populations, with a great phenotypic and, and genomic uh, differences. But what about what's going on within each legs and comparing limnetic to benthic fish in terms of uh, tolerance resistance uh, phenotypes or genomic composition? It's a great question. Um, as a reminder, in the vast majority of lakes, it's not that we have a benthic group and, and a limnetic group, it's that there's a, a, a continuous axis of more benthic to somewhat benthic to generalist to more limnetic to very limnetic that's normally distributed. Um, we could pick individuals at the extremes of this distribution. Um, and it may be that I, I don't see a clear a priori reason why the ecological phenotypes that control that would happen to be genetically in close linkage with the immune phenotypes that we're looking at. Um, but there are these handful of lakes that have the distinct species pairs. Um, interestingly, the different species pairs, so like the benthics and limnetics in Priest Lake have a higher FST genome-wide than Roberts and Gosling do these allopatric lakes. So the genetic difference between the sympatric pairs is really different compared to allopatric lakes, um, which puzzles us. I don't know why that should be. Um, and, but I am, I'm curious to start looking in the species pair lakes. And Diana Renison has a lot of population genomic data of the benthic species and the limnetic species inside some of these lakes. So we could, um, we could email, I could email Diana this afternoon and say, can you please look at STAT6 and PU1 in your benthic limnetic species pair genomic data sets and tell me if you see big allele frequency differences. Um, and I should probably have done that a long time ago. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I have a question. Is the um, uh, fibrosis state reversible? And, and if yes, is there uh, any variation for it? Yes and yes. Um, so I, I briefly mentioned this injection experiment where we had lab-raised fish and we injected them with either saline solution or alum or tapeworm protein. And one of the populations we worked with um, had, and we did this as a time series. So we assayed their fibrosis 24 hours after injection, 10 days, 35 days, and 90 days. And Roselle Lake, which is a high fibrosis, small tapeworm population. They had more fibrosis one month after injection 
and less fibrosis 90 days after injection. So they clearly were able to mint to remove some of that fibrosis. It wasn't gone, it wasn't back to the resting state even after three months, but they'd clearly resolved some of it. Um, Gosling Lake and the marine fish still had maximal fibrosis three months after in a single injection. So um, I read that as answering, yes, Roselle Lake fish can reduce fibrosis after the fact. And yes, it varies by genotype. And this is very exciting from a biomedical research standpoint. So one of my next grant proposals is to go to the National Institutes of Health and say, we have a genetic difference in how reversible fibrosis is. Wouldn't that be nice to figure out how they do that? Thank you. Uh, I think we are going to uh, stop here. We don't want to abuse uh, your time. Many, many thanks again for uh, giving this uh, very interesting seminar. And I don't know if the organizers have any announcements to make. Well, thank you very much from our side as well. So next week, we will be back at our normal time slot at 11.30. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, merci bien. Thank you so much. Bye Have bye. a nice weekend. You too.